Okay, hello people of YouTube land, those that uh part of the Cringe Crew Gaming Community Discord, those that are listening to us on Spotify, and uh, those that follow Ted and I on Twitch, I am Traductus. And I'm Ted. And uh, this is the Cringe Crew Gaming Movie Review Podcast, where we take a uh, director's uh, filmography and review it. Um, a prototype version of this was the James Bond podcast, where we reviewed all the James Bond series, and uh, the concept of that was uh, be introducing Teddy Newby to the uh, series, and with me being a super fan and comparing views. This uh, segment right now is uh, we're doing Christopher Nolan films, so the roles are reversed. Not saying that I haven't seen any Christopher Nolan movies, but I am a filthy casual Ted. <laughs> You know, this is one of his favorite directors. So, obviously interesting. Uh, if you seen previous episodes of this podcast before, um, you probably heard the spiel already, or just like, okay, get on and get over with. <laughs> get on with it. But anyway, uh, we are uh, reviewing The Dark Knight Rises. I keep forgetting the rice yeah. part on that. So we did the dark. We did the Which, Dark Knight two weeks ago. Yeah, I mean, so uh, I'm just gonna say like a dislike right off the bat. I don't like the um, uh, title. <laughs> <laughs> but that's neither here or there. Uh, anyway, uh, we're gonna go over uh, background information on the film. Uh, a budget of 250 to 300 uh, million gross, and it gained a oh, and for a uh, net wow, so there's gross and net, Jesus. Uh, yeah, the budget for the uh, net budget was 230 million, and the box office was uh, 1.081 billion dollars. So that's a uh, pretty damn good profit. <laughs> That's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that being said, a uh, bunch of uh, people come back. Uh, Christian Bale, Michael Caine, Gary Oldman, uh, even uh, Killian Murphy comes back, and so does Liam Neeson in a flashback. Um, and there's also like a uh, flashback and archival footage of uh, Evan Eckhart as uh, Two Face, but also more importantly, the person that comes back is cinematographer Wally Fister, and this is probably the last time I'm going to make that joke <laughs> and laughing at that name. <laughs> God damn it, stop! Uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> We have to have other bits besides the um counter, which is probably at three. <laughs> You're not far. Uh, where was I? Okay, so uh, this uh, movie uh, originally was actually going to have the Joker in it. Uh, and it was actually going to be... Uh, Thinking of like uh, how like a subplot of uh, Michael J. White's character of Gamble surviving his encounter with the with the Joker. As a matter of fact, uh, there's a deleted scene where he's just maimed as opposed to the Joker killing him. Uh, and he was basically supposed to take over Gotham City, and uh, the Joker was supposed to be in the Scarecrow's role of being the uh, gavel dude, you know, the judge, judge. but uh, gavel after dude. Nolan died during filming of um, not Nolan Heath Ledger, not Nolan, god damn it, Heath Ledger sorry, <laughs> we just woke up <laughs> uh, yeah, after uh, uh, Ledger died during filming of The Dark Knight, that was scrapped and uh, instead, they brought in Bane and 
uh, decided to make a uh, sequel that is loosely based off of aspects of Char the Charles Dickens novel A Tale of Two Cities. And there's a few homages to that. Uh, there's a few uh, uh, characters that are uh, symbolizing characters in A uh, Tale of uh, Two Cities, including uh, Philip Striver, played by uh, Bern Gorman, uh, who is known for his role as uh, Owen Harper in the BBC series Torchwood. Uh, his character is, uh, his name is actually f named after the character C.J. Striver in A Tale of Two Cities. Uh, there's also a reference to one of the villains in A Tale of Two Cities with uh, uh, Bane's uh, parachute cord being like hand braided. Uh, the studio wanted uh, the Riddler to be in this and wanted Christopher Nolan to cast Leonardo DiCaprio as the Riddler, but Nolan wa wanted an antagonist to be uh, very, very different. Someone that was also that was physically matched with uh, Batman, but also was very, very smart. And Bane fit that criteria. Um, that being said, I think we should really go right into casting. Uh, we're just going to talk about like new people. We have Anne Hathaway as Selena Kyle and Catwoman. Uh, one of the uh, writers of the script, uh, David S. Goyer, uh, originally ruled out having Catwoman in this movie since uh, Catwoman already appeared. And uh, Tim Burton's uh, Batman Returns, played by Michelle Pfeiffer. Uh, I figured that was probably, uh, figured, you know what, add Catwoman in it, since we already have Bane in it, who was there previously. <laughs> and uh, Batman Forever, which is the only good Joel Schumacher Batman movie out of the two that he directed. Um... Han Hathaway, while auditioning for this role, didn't know that she was being considered for Selena Kyle. So, so what did she think she was auditioning for? I don't know. Wikipedia does not say. I just, I, I just, I, I wonder what role she was aiming for to end up with Selena Kyle. But anyway. <laughs> But Hathaway described the role as the most physically demanding role that she's ever played, and uh, she said she thought of herself as being fit, but had to redouble her gym efforts to keep up with the demand of the role. Uh, she said that she strayed exclusively in martial art, I mean, extensively in martial arts, and took inspiration from uh, an, Austri an Austrian-born actress by the name of Hedy Lamarr, who was inspiration for the comic book character. Um, we also have Tom Hardy as Bane, and, uh, like, Hardy definitely wanted his character to be more menacing than Robert Swenson's, uh, version in Joel Schumacher's, uh, oh, Bane was in Batman and Robin, I thought he was in Batman for, god damn it, that shows you how much I blocked out Batman and Robin. <laughs> uh, but... So, uh, that being said, uh, Tom Hardy purposely, uh, created a contradiction between his voice and how his body looked. Uh, Hardy gained 30 pounds for the role, uh, increased his weight to 200 pounds. Uh, Hardy based Bade's voice off of several influences, including Bare Knuckle Boxer, uh, Bartley Gorman, and also the char character's comic book heritage. Um, with that being said, uh, after looking it up, Bane, uh, despite in the comics being Hispanic, does have his father being a, uh, a guy that was British. So, therefore, we have a extremely, extremely British <laughs> Bane. <laughs> in this, uh, we have uh, 
marrying uh, Cuddlard, who played, uh, I guess, the primary antagonist of Inception. In this, she plays Miranda Tate, and spoiler, plays uh, uh, Liam Neeson, you know, character, Raza Ghoul's daughter, Talia Al Ghoul. And uh, teen actress uh, Joey Keane uh, plays a young Talia Al Ghoul in uh, flashbacks for uh, the character of John Blake, who is later revealed to be named Robin John Blake as a homage to the character of Robin, is played by Joseph Gordon Levitt. And I think that's basically all that I. As far as like notable characters, yeah, that would be it. I mean, the st- I mean, a bunch of the Steelers make cameos because <laughs> this is filmed in Pittsburgh. Uh, but yeah, that's about. Oh, one more fun fact. Uh, well, in the middle of work, like during pre-production, David S. Goyer, who was writing the screenplay, ended up leaving this to work on uh, Man of Steel. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And uh, what will probably set this up for uh, later on while we talk about this movie, uh, Nolan wasn't sure if he was going to make this movie because he wanted a... uh, a story that he could be interested in and committed to <laughs> because uh he said like um if i can find it oh yeah uh yeah he only agreed to do the third film on a basis of finding a worthwhile story fearing that he would become bored halfway through production if he discovered the film to be unnecessary <laughs> and uh also stated uh on a more sufficient level, I have, a, I have to ask the question, how many good third movies in a franchise can people name? And definitely did not want this movie to be like a forgettable third film. Yeah, and, I, I think it's interesting because if the like if the plot was set up to be based around like a sequel straight from the Joker, right? That like they could have done that train of thought again and then your perfect Joker character dies. Uh and needing to come up with a different Batman story from scratch. I, I can understand being jaded about it. Yeah. And But at least it ties from the first film. I mean, but they could have just easily just done like a standalone film. And this movie could have been easily standalone. But that being said, uh, I guess we'll go into uh, you talking about the plot. Sure. Um, so, I, like, as with the other Batman movies, it's pretty simple. I'm not going to, you know, overdo it. Uh, essentially, Bane comes to finish the work of Ra's al Ghul and the League of Shadows from the first film. Um, obviously, as you mentioned earlier, there's a twist with who's involved and why they're all involved. Uh, Talia al Ghul then being Ra's al Ghul's daughter, despite being, you know, infiltrating Wayne Enterprises. Um, Batman sort of has... Or Christian Bale, I guess, his, his character, uh, has an identity crisis of sorts and tries to, you know, reteach himself to be Batman. Uh, Ro- uh, Robin gets revealed to, to be Joseph Gordon-Levitt, like, assisting along with the plot line. Uh, y- yeah, it's a, it's a Batman movie. <laughs> yeah, and Selena Kyle's tried to, like, get her record uh, cleared. <laughs> the clean slate. So, uh, likes and dislikes... Who's going first? What are we doing first? Uh, I'll, I'll start with likes. I think our dislike list is going to be longer. But um, so I I guess the, the thing that I appreciate most about this movie um, is that like it really draws from the other two films in an independent way. So, I mean, like that Bane takes all of the, the willpower of Joker, right? He has the inspiration of Ra's al Ghul, but he's definitely his own character. He's not just a henchman following through on a plan. He's definitely his own his own character, but you can see all of the parts that were successful in the other like antagonists that you know help him develop his own character. I, I think that's pretty neat. Um, yeah, I, and, and, and you add also like the 
the costume design is pretty damn good. <laughs> Yeah, costumes are good. Camera work is fantastic. Um, they did do a lot of interesting shots, uh, and I think the physics of of the camera work was really cool. Um, the f opening scene that's in the plane as the plane, you know, gets tipped and is hanging there, like where gravity changes. I think they do a really good job filming that. Um, all over the place, the 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 camera work is is fantastic, and the lighting is significantly better in this one than the last two. Um, I didn't think it was bad in the last two, but like. I think everything is is better lit. Um, the one thing that I think is really interesting, too, is um, the influence of the villain, right? So um, the when the plane goes down, I'm going to go back to the opening scene, right? When the plane goes down, he takes the, the strap off of the guy and tells him, you need to die in this plane crash because they're expecting one person to be aboard. And he goes, okay, boss, and just waits to die. Like, the cult that is Bane, uh, I think, is pretty impressive. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And this honestly makes me want to, like, read A Tale of Two C Cities. Because, like, uh, it's interesting. See, now I will now I will have some dislikes with the plot <laughs> when we get to dislikes. But I'd say the thing, certain aspects that I like in the plot is... How Bane is basically starts like a revolution in Gotham to cover up ulterior motives of like destroying Gotham completely. So it so he kind of seems like comes off as more as like a liberator as opposed to like the you know one of like the true villains of like what's going on. Yeah, he does have a really good uh, public relations focus. <laughs> like, um, I think the the other thing specifically with Tom Hardy as Bane, right? I mean, you kind of you kind of highlighted it earlier that like they didn't get a, a an OG Mexican luchador, right? Um, right. And I will. And by the way, Ted challenged me to find a uh, uh, substitute for well, this that would be a little bit more accurate. I did, however, I could not li li narrow it down to one person because we'll, of. We'll get there in a, a minute. couple of reasons. Anyway, um, I, I I know that the casting is quote unquote whitewashed. I get that like it's not the standard character that you would expect it to be, but my challenge is that like. They can't cast just a 300,000 pound juicer of a fucking luchador to give an acting performance that's required for this film. I just, I don't think such a human exists. You can wiggle your finger all you want. This is an audio medium. Stallman, you need to talk. All right. All right. So, I, uh, we were going back and forth on this, so we couldn't really find, like, an actor that had, like, the in-depth... The closest thing we kind of got was, like, if he was still alive, it probably could have been Eddie Guerrero, but we weren't sure how good of an actor, like, Eddie Guerrero would be, because just because someone's a professional wrestler doesn't mean they transition to film very well. Like, very, once in a while you get, like, you know, ones that are, like, really, really good, like, uh... The Rock is good for what he is. So is uh, Roddy Piper. Like, and Roddy Piper makes the movie They Live. But at the same time, you get duds like Hulk Hogan. <laughs> you know? So it's not an exact uh, science of, like, putting a professional wrestler in there. Uh, we were thinking, like, actor-wise, the closest thing was, like, Benicio Del Toro. But then I was thinking, well... Uh, there are, there have been luchadors that were so huge that they were in like films like uh case in point El Santo and Blue Demon were in many like B movies and their uh um heirs with uh uh El Santo's son being a uh, son of you know son of El Santo his the the Hispanic word for that <laughs> uh, um, was also in a couple movies. I think Blue Demon Jr., uh, who is the adopted son of Blue Demon, has been in films. And I was thinking, well, they both have played villains in the ring, and they both have acted experience. This would be perfect. But then you kind of think, well... I've heard Blue Demon kind of, like, speak in English 
<laughs> and it's not very good. So, so there's that problem as the language barrier. But on top of that, with Blue Demon and uh, Son of El Santo, the thing with luchadors, if they haven't been unmasked, or if they're, like, retired, you know, uh, they're going to have that mask on at all times. And even though Bane's face is, like, has a mask, they have to take that mask off and put that thing on there, and... Luchadors are very, very protective of their identity because it's like a superhero thing, you know? That was um, a really long-winded way to say that Tom Hardy is the best choice as an overall haul for this role. Shut up. All right. So the only alternative that I could think of, I was thinking of like a luchador that was, uh, that could have fit the role. Because the only way I could think of was like, well, a professional wrestler could work the physical thing, but you would have to have someone in depth for the voiceover. So, there is a wrestler by the name of Mil Mortez, whose character, whose real name is Ricky Banderas. Uh, he, he actually has wrestled without his mask. He fits like the physical role. However, to do the voice acting, I was thinking Benicio Del Toro because he was the only person I could think of that could do a menacing enough performance vocal wise but for like a single person in there like yeah tom hardy was a really good choice for the role and it's kind of hard at that time period to really pick someone <laughs> that would fit the role exactly all right that had the best of both worlds eight without minute. having like, to hire two people Eight minutes to say I was right. Okay, so my point in all of that, um, not to get totally lost. The photo after the podcast, look up though Mortez. Okay. Like the dude character looks like freaking Bane. So, <laughs> uh, but that being said, yeah, Tom Hardy didn't do a bad job. Uh, I think uh, since I guess we're talking, uh, are we gonna? I, I was. With, like, I, I, st I, st I still haven't finished my thought. Oh, sorry. <laughs> God. Uh, no. So I I appreciate that. Like, even though Bane isn't the standard comic book character, right? Tom Hardy really fills the role well, and I think that there's a very cool. Like they they've rewritten the origin story, right? Like original comic book Bane is not just like or is is just a juicer basically. He's just looking for his his his. He's more poison kind of well, i forget what they call it in in the comic book it's called venom. Ven i thought so but i didn't want to fuck it up but yeah he's looking for his venom that's keeping him alive right they've kind of replaced that aspect with uh the mask that keeps him out of pain right but like they didn't just have him chasing steroids right like he had totally different motives and and, and like clearly the same inspiration for a character but with the casting that may not be a hundred percent comic book accurate. They also gave him an origin story that's different from what it was before. So I can appreciate that. Comic book aspects because uh, Bane in the comics does join the League of Shadows. Right. Uh, so there's that aspect. Uh, they do also have Bane's origin a little bit with him actually being born in the prison. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's it's not a complete detraction, but it's also not right. like standard cut and dry. This is where we're going. Exactly. Um, at least it's a hell of a lot better portrayal than it is in Batman and Robin, where he's just it's just a juice head and just like smashes shit. <laughs> For every time we've uh, mentioned that movie, I'm gonna make you review it. I swear to God. <laughs> if we have to go, you know, I don't, I won't mind actually going through Joel, Joel Schumacher's filmography because there's some good gems in that, like Saint Elmo's Fire, uh, Falling Down. I think he did Phone Booth. Phone Booth's actually a pretty damn good one, but he also made shit like Batman and Robin. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, so. you, you, you did mention sticking on acting performances. So the last thing that I want to get to on my likes list, um, Anne Hathaway was flawless. Um, she she did a really good job. I, I don't necessarily think of her as like a phenomenal actress. I'm not saying that she's bad by any means, but I think she really fits the role well. Um, it definitely fits all of the hits, all the right notes that you'd want this character to hit, like both from the portrayal in the movie, but also the way that the comic is written. Like, I, th I think she really nails the character. 
Yeah, I think the thing with Anne Hathaway is that she gets typecasted a lot as, like, a girl next door. And when she does take on roles that are, like, get away from the uh, typecast, she really shines. Like, a prime example is the uh, movie Havoc, uh, which is a freaking gritty movie. It's basically about a bunch of rich kids that are into, like, hip-hop culture, you know, cultural appropriation and stuff like that. I think they're all, like, thugs and stuff. And then they uh, go into, like, the ghetto and then hang out with a bunch of drug dealers and then shit just goes, you know, south because, you know, they ain't about that life, you know? And Anne Hathaway kills it in that role and to me like I really see that you know when she's actually gets a chance to act <laughs> uh, she really dedicates it to that role and she knocks it out of the park I think Joseph Gordon-Levitt knocks it out of the park as well in this I think he does a damn good job in this movie as well I think both of them do the uh, best acting out of the entire movie. Uh, Gordon Levitt's okay. I I think that he's a, a terrific actor, and I don't think this is his best performance. I just think the his I think best the performance character just fits such a weird spot. Like I, they give him simultaneously too much and not enough time. I I don't know how to better explain it, but like they put him on in weird moments as filler, but they also like keep him out when you like he has something to contribute. It's it's it, uh, the character's weird. I think that takes away from that. Yeah, a little yeah. Bit. I mean, for what he was given, he does a phenomenal job. Oh yeah, absolutely. Do you, um, do you have more on your likes list, or you just want to get into the rants? I got one more. Well, uh, we already gave Tom Hardy praise, so. Uh, yeah, right. Tom Hardy, unnecessary badass. He needs to add the addendum to the end of his name. Um. All right. That being <laughs> said, here comes the freaking dislikes and the rants. Oh, God. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit more petty. All right. Despite Bane looking really, really good. All right. There's some aspects of what Tom Hardy does where it makes zero sense. There's a lot of cases where Bane's just walking around holding his coat like this. And I just want to scream at the uh, screen just going, You are not Ted DiBiase, the $10 million dollar man. How does this scream revolutionary? This screams rich, smug prick. <laughs> um, that being said... Bane's voice is terrible. Completely freaking terrible and distracting. Every time I hear him talk, I think Sean Connery. I it's definitely weird, but I don't I don't know if it's distracting. Connery, I get, but it's it's just high pitched nasally Connery, I guess. It doesn't it doesn't bother me. It's definitely like notable, but I, I don't know that it's distracting. It's hard to take him serious because he says like pretty damn menacing stuff, but it's just said in some like really like mundane way that's just like she's just taking a stroll in the park and it's like <sighs> I, I don't know I think his voice is like it's set that way it's not just a standard voice right I think about the scene where they where they capture uh, Commissioner Gordon right and like yeah. the stuff that he has to say is profound and it sticks out because his voice is different than the other ambiguous faceless voiceless nameless thugs that are in the in the rest of the case like i don't know that it's the best choice or what set like but it certainly sets him apart i think it makes what he has to say stand out i, I don't know that it's distracting as much as notable for me yeah i don't know if it's because the sound mixing with like what what the oh, format that we're watching it because like his voice is way too freaking loud. Ple Plex is awful, right? So it I, I don't know what causes it, but it makes it where the sound effects and the dialogue are on two different tracks. The dialogue is always down here. The sound effects and the music are always up here. And I guess whatever ha happens with Bane's voice makes him with the sound effects. So he's talking like he's shouting at you. And everybody else is kind of down here like this. And it's ju it's just, it's so, it is so awful. Uh, but I, again, that's just the platform, not the actual movie design and 
By the way, that is the minor gripes that we have with this film. Because to be honest, this movie is all not is all fluff to the point where it's way too long, but it also doesn't give you enough where you actually feel like you watched a full movie. It's like you missed a movie in between. Because like I don't know where Batman's just crippled. Okay. Um there's like a bunch of things that happen in between like both movies that gets like mentioned like in a sentence or two that are extremely important to the plot but you're just like you kind of forget about it you're just like well, what the f it's like so why is he losing oh yeah he invested it all in this infusion reactor and Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's real uh, easy to get lost in a very simple linear plot because shit is explained very briefly and there's a lot of bullshit in between. I guess they just do like they do a whole lot of extra work to make the setup feel like it's part of any other part of a Batman movie that or a Christopher Nolan Batman movie, you know? But I, I guess like there's just so much that like you know, in in the other films, right, you could go to anything in the Dark Knight and all of it's important. There's a reason that they're showing it to you. And here, like, even when it is important, it just kind of feels like it doesn't because there's just so much exposition that you need. You know, you need the injury. You need to know that he was a recluse and you need to know that, like, the funding is stopped and that, you know, Wayne Enterprises is through the shitter and that they build a fusion reactor and who uh, Talia Al Ghul is and like what Bane is up to oh. and Cat And there's just so much setting and up. And Alfred's character just does like a complete 180. <laughs> oh, yeah. As opposed to being supportive of Batman, he's very unsupportive and just like, I don't want you to die. It's like, I understand that now that he's crippled, but like Bruce Wade shows that he has like a thing that stops him from being crippled so it's like how is the crippled thing you know integral to the plot you know yeah everything just takes a super long time to develop and admittedly like if you need to hit all of those strokes like it, if everything in there is vital to the end game of the movie like there's not a whole lot that they could cut i get it but also like the plot needs to be more concise because it just felt like everything took forever and none of it felt important there was this movie was definitely full of fluff uh, gosh, uh, I would also say the villain deaths in this are very, like, underwhelming. <sighs> Not saying that, uh, Bane's is, like, completely horrible, but, like, you it seems very anticlimactic of him just getting shot by Selena Kyle while she's on, like, her mo that motorcycle. And then Talia Al Ghul's is the worst villain death ever. It's I like she wrecks the car <sighs> and then just, like... She goes, oh, I'm dying, <laughs> violently thrusts her head to the left and closes her fucking eyes. It's, it, it, it is the worst portrayed death I've ever fucking seen. And on top of that, a lot of, like, the acting in this is, like, very mediocre, like, with the exception of, like, some, a couple, like, standout performances, like, the rest of this is just, like, business as usual, and... Christian Bale definitely looks like he's, like, phoning it in. He phoned it in. Alfred phoned it in. Uh, Morgan Freeman as Lucius Fox phoned it in, um, though his appearance was pretty brief. Um, the woman who played Talia, again, phoned it in. Like, everybody just felt soft. Even Gary Oldman phoned it in. And I don't know how the hell Gary Oldman phoned stuff in. <laughs> he did okay. They just didn't give him the same kind of platform that, the, that he had had in the previous two, so... I, he didn't but, bother me as bad, but I think the biggest issue in this movie is that it just seems like it doesn't really matter. Yeah, you know, and I wasn't, I wasn't expecting it to be as good as The Dark Knight. I wasn't. I was expecting it to maybe be better than Batman Begins, but like, I really, because like when I first watched it, I was kind of a little bit bummed out when it came out. Like, I didn't think it was good as The Dark Knight, but, like, I wasn't, like, disappointed or, like, meh about it. And I think it doesn't help that we watched Inception before this, because it seems like we're kind of 
you know, taking like a dip in quality, like Nolan's getting like burned out, which makes me scared for Interstellar. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, and also probably Dunkirk. So uh, yeah, it, it, it's it, it definitely like. It feels like we're plateauing from the Dark Knight. Admittedly, it's hard to keep up with that kind of quality. Like, I, I, I definitely think the order in which these movies came out does not help this one. But you're right. It, I mean, it's it's a very long movie that just doesn't feel like it's worth the time. Um, and I, I guess like even the writing felt a little lazier in this one. Like one of my major gripes is the the twist where the woman who's on the board of Wayne Enterprises takes over as chairman of the board and turns out to be the villain. Right? Like. It's right. very scripted. Which, it's very obvious it, from the beginning, and the characters are all just fucking oblivious because the writing's just so piss poor. Which checks out for Talia Al Ghul, but like, it would have been a you could have been a little bit more nuanced about. It. <laughs> yeah, it, it's so obvious. Like, I I hesitate to even call it a twist because it's almost like they're telling you at the beginning of the movie, "Hey, she's going to turn out to be the bad guy." It's very very obvious. Drives me kind of nuts, but yeah. That's literally all I got. Yeah. Uh, like, there's really nothing to this movie. Yeah. Overall, I don't. It's biggest detriment. I, I don't think it's bad, right? Like, it, I'm not I'm not even yeah. going to tell you it's not worth the watch, but it definitely doesn't stand up to the other movies here. And it and it is a very long commitment to be kind of eh about it. I think that brings us to rankings then. Uh, Ted, you want to go first or you want me to go first? Um, I I think I'll take it. I'm I'm so I'm gonna put it uh seventh. It's still gonna be ahead of Insomnia for me, but I think it's significantly behind Inception. Um, I I I remembered liking this movie a whole lot more. Um, and it just kind of like like you said, it, it's just kind of a disappointment because it doesn't feel worthwhile. It feels like they're setting up for a Robin franchise that we all know is never gonna happen. It kind of feels like this was just trying to give Batman a good wrap up that honestly was not really that good and i don't know there's definitely positives to it but it's not nolan's best work by any stretch yeah i was debating on whether to put this below or above insomnia um just because like they have similar gripes <laughs> Like, either, like, some of the character... It's like you have some people that are standout characters in this, but at the same time, there's, like, a lot of things that seem phoned in or, like, just kind of, like, don't amount to anything. But I think I'm putting it in the same spot just because I think, like, uh... that there's more, like, positive acting in this from uh Ed Hathaway, Joseph Gore Levitt, and even Tom Hardy, as opposed to just Robin Williams and Al Pacino and Insomnia. That's <laughs> fair. Know? That's even fair. Though I, so, even though I do find Insomnia a little bit more interesting, just because like Robin Williams just being a psychopath and a creep in that movie, but like um which is kind of funny because, like, there was rumors that it, before, like, people were thinking that it was going to be Bane, people thought it was going to be Robin Williams as the calendar man for this movie as the main villain, but, uh, that was obviously bullshit, but, um, yeah, uh, putting Batman, The Dark Knight Returns in the same spot. This is definitely the weakest out of the three movies by a long shot. <sighs> by a damn long shot. I didn't think it was going to be that big of a long shot. I thought like it was going to be really close between that and Batman Begins, but it's not. I did, yeah, I didn't think so either. It's not it's, even it's, close it's, to Inception. Yeah, it's it, it's it's a pretty big gap. But um, with that, um, next week will be what are we? Next week's Interstellar, right? Yep. All right. So next week we'll watch Interstellar. Um, well, the podcast will see it. If you join the Discord and hop in on Tuesdays to watch with us, we're going to be a little bit ahead, so you probably won't be watching Interstellar, but yeah. I think you'll have a movie or two to go. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, may no. 
No, because after Interstellar, it's Dunkirk, Tenet, and we're done. So by the time you're seeing this, there's no more movies left to watch. <laughs> um, well, at least not for Christopher or, or, Nolan. Or, 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 yeah, of Christopher yeah. Nolan. <laughs> yeah, we will be watching something else, but um, what we're working on is still in the works. So we got to figure out what it is. But you can hop in the Discord, watch movies with us. If you're interested in our other content, you can check out the rest of the YouTube channel or find us both on Twitch. Stallman at Traductus, my set at te- myself at Ted Green Eagles. And with that... Guess that's all we got, so we'll see you next week.